Okay, so I just started recording. Okay, so can we get started with roll call as first item? Okay, so um, it's 5.30. Um, Mark Husband? Uh, present. Christine Adams? Um, oh, Christine got, muted. Okay, <laughs> she has her mic. <laughs> Um, Kate Trusta. Be responsible. Here. Jim Woodward. Here. Stephen Young. Here. Um, did I miss any other member? Um, we have Inglewood School Liaison Gary Manfrey. Present. Um, right now, not present, we have Karen Miller and Council Member John Stone. Staff, we have Christina Underhill, Director. Open Space Manager Dave Lee and myself Debbie Severa, um, and we have staff Allison Boyd going to and attendees. We have um, Brad Patterson and Charles Parker. So under um, public comment, we'll ask if they would like to speak to the commission. Okay. Okay. Um, we can do that next. Let's 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 go ahead and look at the minutes, though, before we move to public comment. Um, does anyone have any comments, corrections, additions to the minutes? No. Does anyone like to move the minutes? I'll move the minutes. I'll second that. All those in favor of accepting the minutes as? As presented? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Okay. Um, Thank you. Then let's, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's see if our guests would like to uh, offer public comment. Um, folks, uh, if you're using the Zoom interface, you should be able to use the hand raise function. Um, and we'll, if you'd like to comment, and we'll do it in the order received. And just please uh, try to limit your comments to about three minutes. All right. Do we have any hands? We do. Charles Parker. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, I just wanted to listen in and hear what the uh, outcome is about dog parks and particularly Emerson Park. I read something that uh, a few parks are gonna be closed and then Emerson and another one, I forget which one it was, would be, uh, an off-leash dog park. So I just wanted to hear what your thoughts were and uh, when that would be presented to City Council and how long, uh, how long of a process would that be before this, you know, might become a reality if, if they are in agreement with you guys. So that's pretty much it for me. I don't know if Brad has anything to offer, but So uh, to answer part of your question, Charles, um, um, the recommendation from this subcommittee that we had formed um, to the commission is in the packet today, and we're going to discuss it. I think Kate will probably, as part of the agenda, will lead us through the, the, the main points of it. Um, I think what we'd like to do, or what I think the appropriate thing to do is uh, talk about whether everyone's comfortable with the as it is or whether folks would like um, to discuss possible changes to it and 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 then take a vote as to submitting it to City Council now after that I can't really say um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to add about that but I can't really say what what exactly what kind of time frames for example City Council will take or, or whether they'll support it in part or in all or not at all I, I can't I can't really say um, does anyone else have anything to offer as a answer for Charles regarding council? I would just say, Mark, that was, that was great. And I think that depending on what happens tonight and what we collectively decide as a commission, we'll just determine the timeline. So we don't really know Charles, like we'll see what comes of this meeting. Okay, great. Thank you.
Uh, so if there's no other public comments, then I think we can move to oops, some. So Dave would like to speak. Oh, okay. Go ahead. I'm trying to get back on my agenda here. Okay, I just wanted to add, um, and Christina, you can chime in as well. My guess is that the, the meeting minutes and, and notes and everything would go to council with a recommendation, but my guess is that council would likely want to have this topic scheduled as a study session topic to further discuss it before any kind of action would move forward on the proposals. Yeah, Dave, that's that's correct. And uh, most likely there'll be once once everything, whatever decisions made is uh, approved and moved forward, uh, it'll probably be a, a month or two before anything would go to an effect because you now go into a marketing mode and there'll be some other steps in place um, to help advertise what changes are going to happen before the changes actually take effect. So, um, yeah, at this point, it'd probably be fall or early winter before uh, whatever changes are proposed and accepted would go into effect. Yeah, along with that, good points, Christina. Uh, we would likely have at least one, if not a series of public meetings to um, have the public weigh in on it as well. <coughs> okay. And Mark, Thanks. I know Brad Patterson had his hand up to speak. No Brad, problem. if you would like to still speak to the commission. Okay. Okay, then I think that uh, takes us to uh, shareback funds. Christina, is that your item about the uh, ACOS shareback funds? Um, <laughs> no, Dave, is that yours? <laughs> Either one of us. Um, we just uh, received a letter a number of weeks ago from Arapahoe County. Um, every year they send us shareback funds based off of the sales tax and off the city's population size. And we typically budget around $800,000 um, moving forward, but we were surprised this year that it was uh, $977,000. So about $177,000 more than we're typically accustomed to taking in. And I think that just kind of shows how strong the economy was before the coronavirus impacted it. And if anybody's got any questions, that's really it. Anybody has any questions, just let me know. Where do those funds go? Do they just go into the general fund and how are they allocated? No, they don't go into the general fund. Um, they go into the open space fund. Mm. And from there, they go to our perennial projects, uh, parks equipment, flower bed program, landscaping, uh, tree maintenance, things like that. Um, so they'll go towards all of that. Uh, contingency, uh, grant matching funds, all of those type of projects. Great, thank you. Dave, did we get any uh, grants at that presentation? Um, no, the, the grants will be announced in early August. Typically, if we're successful with our grant <laughs> application, they'll notify us a couple of weeks earlier. So we might know something the end of July, but typically there's a, a formal uh, letter that goes out somewhere the first week of August. Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, well, that leads us back to uh, off-leash dogs. So Kate, would you like to just give us kind of an overview? Yeah. I, I hope everyone had a chance, you know, hopefully to, to look at what was in there um, yeah. as far as the recommendations. But yeah, I think it'd be helpful if you could just give an overview. Absolutely. Uh, you know I'm happy to. It's my favorite subject. 
<laughs> so, um, you know, I think you all saw the notes in the appendix that kind of gives the overview of the conversations we've had over the last year and a half. And on May 26, we came together and we talked about it for a while. And these are our recommendations. So first up, we think that um, off-leash dog privileges should be eliminated at Centennial, Jason, and Duncan Parts, Parks. The main reason to do this is the fact that there's athletic fields and shelters where there's a lot of children and families. And we think by removing that, it will help Englewood as a whole. Um, next, we would like to keep the Northwest Greenbelt as an off-leash dog park. And then also, you know, honor the citizens' request to make Emerson Park an off-leash dog park. Um, that would mean that those parks are essentially all of the open park hours allowed. Um, there's no shelters or athletic fields or playgrounds. So we, well, there is one at Green Belt, but we feel like that would kind of um, be a good answer to the question of having the north and south side dog parks. Then we would like the Parks and Rec Department to create a plan for how we're going to secure funding and what a dog park would look like in Cushing Park. This is something that we have been talking about since 2017, so I think that is a good time now to act upon it. Um, to share these changes, we would like the Parks and Rec Department to continue the Take the Lead campaign and create some content around the changes, the opening of a park, what the new park would look like, just really informing the citizens so that they are well, you know, basically well informed and maybe more open to these changes. And then finally, this is something that I've been wanting to bring up for a while, so I kind of threw it in there. Um, but I think that it would be great to create other ways that communities could socialize if we're removing the dog park privileges. We do have the athletic fields at um, you know, Jason and Duncan. And I think that by creating adult sports leagues, it would be a way where people can connect, that dogs are involved in the picture and also kind of fill those times when dogs would be allowed off leash there. So basically those are our changes or recommendations. And I mean, I would love to get some feedback. This is definitely a work in progress. So anything that anyone thinks, please let us know. I'd like to. You guys love it? Well, <laughs> I have a couple questions. Sure. Um, I guess first one for Debbie. Do, do we just on mute to be recognized or just speak up and be on mute? Um, you know, <laughs> go ahead and just um, keep your mics on mute, but when you want to speak, just unmute them. I think that's worked in the past. If we have a problem where people start talking over each other, then we'll ask you to raise your hands, but we won't have you do that right now. Okay. I'll make it easier. Um, with regard to Emerson Park, did you talk at all about making that a pilot plan for a year or 18 months? And where my concern is, is that it could turn into what was Bates Logan when it was had the off-leash privileges and uh, it was I mean all of South Denver a good portion of South Denver that had dogs were there mm -hmm. twice a day we, so. we, talked a, we talked a little bit about that um, I guess the feeling was and, and you guys can correct me if I mischaracterize our discussion about it is that when you do a pilot, um, there's this there's this sort of you know the 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 pretense is that you're going to have some point at which you reevaluate based on the experience of running the pilot. In in reality, it's often very difficult to remove a privilege like that once you know once it's been instated, even even under the pretense of it being a pilot, unless there's some real problem. And I suppose my thought about it is that if there are real problems, then we can reverse the policy, regardless of whether it's characterized as a as a new as a new rule or as a pilot. 
So if if there are, you know, up, up to this point, we, we <laughs> felt like there's general support from the community around there. There are some folks that have submitted complaints about it, but it, they're, they're, they seem to principally be about just the idea that folks are, are not following the rules there. So, you know, if, if there were a lot of complaints or if there are incidents or there's damage to the park, um, then I think regardless of whether it's characterized as a pilot or not, I think we could re always reevaluate uh, the policy there. Does that seem fair? <coughs> it, it just seems odd to me that we would make the smoking policies in the parks a pilot program. Yeah. And this not a pilot program. <laughs> but it, I can go along with that, with that understanding. I'm just. Well, does anyone else have any thoughts about the value of characterizing it as a pilot? I mean, I, I think it's a fairly fine distinction, but. Um, maybe, maybe there is value in characterizing it that way. I, I think it helps people like Charles Parker to tell any Denver friends or whatever, or tell other people that, hey, this, we have a chance of losing this if this doesn't work out. And, you know, you go, need to go to a Denver dog park or something like that. But I kind of think that even if that is, whether or not it's a pilot or program or not, the residents, based on what they've told us, are still going to sort of be monitoring the area. So I would assume they're kind of the first line of defense if, it's like, if, if things are happening. I mean, I think Charles is there every day. So he can, either he can warn or people can just see and they're welcome to come back to the meetings once a month and let us know. But yeah, I mean, we had talked a little bit, like Mark said, about the pilot program, but it just seemed like it was one of these things where if you put it in, if it, it it almost forces you to go back and look at it at another year and if there's an issue then we can address it whether it's six months in or five years in okay i i can go along with that i would also yeah. add that i just think it's kind of it's hard to measure what if you have a pilot program is a success or things to work on so by just deciding to move forward with it it kind of takes it out where we don't have to evaluate later on like Stephen just said okay i would i would like to echo what mark <laughs> and kate and Stephen said you know jim if you remember we put the um, off leash um, program for those five parks together and we had a year's worth of a pilot program and I would say during that year that things went along I think very well and I don't recall any complaints it wasn't until well after a year that things started to fall apart at the parks between um, people using the shelter the sports teams uh, the dog owners and things like that so I, I agree with the off-leash task force in that if there are issues down the road, whether they're six months, a year, or five years, you address them at that point and then make whatever changes are necessary. Okay, I'm agreeable to that. Does anyone else have any comments about the content of the recommendation? Uh, I, one thing I'll just mention, and, and, and Kate did go over it, but you know, I think <laughs> where we kind of landed on it is that, you know, in terms of having just a really clear rationale to be able to communicate to the public about the reason for withdrawing off-lease privileges in the three locations that we're talking about withdrawing them, you know, it hinges on one, youth sports. Um, which is a conflict we've heard plenty about, and it's 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 particularly problematic because that's an activity that the city is taking money from the youth sports league to support this activity with this sort of edible dog use. Likewise, the shelters are rentable spaces, and the utility and quality of the experience of people that are paying to use those shelters are impacted by uh, by off leash poorly behaved off leash dogs. And then the, then the third one was playgrounds. And, and, and obviously we just feel like, you know, neither the, the dogs themselves or the associated waste is something that's compatible with kids and playgrounds. Um, so the, 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 uh, you know, I think, I think that that was a pretty 
straightforward line of reasoning to develop for why we're focusing on those three locations that they all three of them have those three facility types and then in the northwest um, I think that the notion over there is that while there is a playground um, but not the other not not the sports or rented pavilions um, the playground could be fenced so that despite the fact that there's off-leash use in the area they would be uh, they would be kept out of the area that the kids are using. So, um, but in, anyway, uh, does anyone else have any comments or ideas about the recommendation? I just want to thank all of you for putting this together so thoughtfully. This is obviously something we've talked about for years. Um, and so it's nice to come to a resolution to it. I'm certainly supportive of everything you've put together. Um, so a huge thank you to all of you for doing this work. Um, I also want to thank the residents around Emerson Park. Regardless of what my feelings are about off-leash area, they did a phenomenal job um, going door to door and really engaging everybody in their neighborhood. Obviously, we'll still continue to have public engagement before this decision is finalized or made or council makes their decision, but um, the amount of effort and how respectful they were in their comments um, and working with their neighbors on understanding their concerns was um, admirable. And so I really want to thank those residents as well who put in a substantial amount of work um, to really understand the issue and present it to us. Thank you, Christine. Well, if, if, if no one has any other suggestions for changes to the recommendation, then I would, I would move um, to submit the recommendations as prepared to council. Um, yeah, if you need a motion, I'll, I'll move the recommendation to council. You have a second? If I can unmute, I'll say second, yes. Okay, all, all those in favor of submitting the recommendation as written to council? Aye. 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 All those opposed? Wow, okay. Great, well, thank you guys very much for looking that over. I think it is, looks like a reasonable compromise approach that will solve the big problems without, um, you know, without maybe applying a overly sort of blanket uh, carte blanche prohibition on something that is popular with a lot of folks. And it'll be very interesting to see what the folks at city council have to say about it and members of the public. Mm -hmm. And you know, I would just like to second what Christine said and thank the task force. You know, Kate, it's been a long time since for you on that task force and, and you, Mark, uh, mm -hmm. and Dave enjoys those things. So yeah. <laughs> but it it well thought out and really compliments to you for coming up with what you've come up with. Thank you. I think we have a, I think it's a good solution. Hopefully the rest of the city likes it too. We'll see where it goes. Thanks Jim, you took the words right out of my mouth. Well, there is there anything else about uh, the question of off-leash dogs before we move on to uh, budget. All right, let's hear about the budget. All right, Debbie, if you can share the presentation. So this presentation um, is pared down a little bit from the original presentation that was given to council. I just wanted to go over the timeline and, and what we're proposing. We kind of briefly discussed it previously, but this is the official presentation. Council has seen it is a work in progress. Uh, staff and myself are currently going line by line through our budget and uh, making corrections, additions, subtractions uh, to it. So um, you can see that on May 26, we took the preliminary operations and capital request budget to council. And um, in July, we are gonna go back to council uh, with our recommendations. And uh, it says August here, but I believe July, we're actually going back um, to present some. And then August, we'll go and present the proposed budget. You can see it's a process all the way through October. So um, 
it's it's a thought out process. It's not something that's just thrown together when it comes to city budgets. And go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so these are uh, meeting community needs when we're going through the budget, not just our department, but citywide, uh, what we're, we're looking at doing. So obviously COVID-19 has been a big focus and recovery of COVID-19 as we move forward. Uh, the Tri-City Homeless Policy Group is another big initiative the city is taking on um, with Sheridan and Littleton. And then focusing on restorative justice, the city has hired a contractor to assist with this, and she actually just came on board uh, last month and is starting that process. Uh, the storm drainage has been a very hot topic within Englewood, and it will continue to be for some time, so that's a focus that we have addressing the sewer and water master plan findings, which um, are happening now, so it's in progress. Fixing alleyway, alleys and uh, maintaining our streets, ensuring well-planned redevelopment, upgrading the parks and re um, improving recreation services. So we made the list, that's always exciting. And then uh, consider trash hauler options. So those are all the items that we're looking at um, that reflect in our budget. So go to the next slide. Uh, meeting the community needs, this is just so you're seeing what council is also addressing is community needs we're addressing, um, making worthwhile community investments that citizens deserve. Um, so like for the dog parks, that'll be something as part of what we've seen in our master plan, adding a dog park into Cushing. So we're trying to address some of the needs that we have. Um, together, our continued focus efforts will be the community investments and um, make them the best they can be, and then obviously together we make it happen. So go to the next slide. So this is uh, expenditures by department. You can see we are the second largest budget in the city, uh, followed by public works. Police will always be number one if we had fire within as well. Usually they're number two, and then parks and rec is number three typically in cities. But um, our budget is just over $8 million. It's 16% of the general fund. Next slide. And then you can just see how it's broken down then um, by category. Salary and wages are the highest, followed by contractual services and then benefits. As far as uh, benefits to the employees, uh, they're anticipating the potentially a six to 8% increase on that, which is unfortunate, but it's a world we live in today. So the budget will have to be adjusted to accommodate those needs. <coughs> Next slide. These are, um, the visions of our, um, our city council, as far as safety, transportation, neighborhoods, infrastructure, economy, sustainability, and then governance. You'll see that um, in the presentation on the slides, how we're addressing those and the percentage of each of the projects um, and what they go towards. Next slide. Next slide. So these are our initiatives or priorities for 2021. Um, completing a design, for broken tea irrigation system. The system is very old and we spend more time fixing it than it actually working. So it's time to get a new design in place. And then um, probably 2022, 23, we'll look at actually doing the replacement to the irrigation system. Uh, focusing on marketing strategies to increase participation and engagement to the community. That really goes on to um, just COVID response as well as the last item too of virtual offerings to our community. It's something that we've uh, been thrown into. I think all recreation, including libraries, wasn't too uh, big on the virtual side because we didn't have to be. We had great in-person offerings. But through COVID, we've had to reinvent ourselves and virtual is the way to go. So we'll continue to do that and uh, increase those efforts. And then also continue to focus on ages 8 to 14 and both library and recreation programming. That's a hard group. Those teens don't really like to hang out uh, with adults, so focusing on adding more programs for them is our goal. Next slide. So uh, this is FTEs we're looking to add. We did discuss before in a pre previous meeting, adding in a park ranger, I think it's essential with the off-leash dog um, changes, uh, if they are accepted or if they're not, and we continue as is. Uh, the park ranger is definitely needed. Uh, code enforcement spends a lot of time as much as they can in the parks, uh, but they have other duties as a sign that they have to focus on too. 
Uh, we, as part of a COVID response and potential deficit in our current budget, turned back a half FTE, a full-time equivalent position, which is $30,000. We anticipate hiring that this year, but we'll, we postponed it to 2021 for salary savings this year. And then um, also addressing the part-time minimum wage increase. Most employees have received that, but a handful to keep us relevant. Uh, we'd like to bump up to hopefully keep them on staff so they don't go somewhere else. So that's only $12,000. So that's all we're asking for. We would love to ask for a lot more, but we're being respectful of the COVID situation and the shortfall in the budget, knowing that's gonna carry on probably for the next year or two. Um, so we're not asking for too much. Next slide. So these are programs um, and services we will continue to offer uh, and next year. Holiday lights on Broadway is something we've done annually. The flower pots on Broadway, maintaining those is another thing. Uh, for our parks division, the Planet uh, Geo software helps identify a lot of issues in our parks and help us stay proactive. There's also a lot of great forms that help our uh, efficiency in the park site as far as playground inspections, or irrigation repairs, you name it, it has it. I think it'd be a great benefit to our parks division to have that type of software in their pocket and be able to use it daily. Uh, something that we just inherited, but we're uh, putting in our budget and maintaining it is the Museum of Outdoor Arts, uh, which is the 48,000. I actually think this is incorrect and finance will be changing it the next presentation. I believe it's only 24,000 that is uh, going to Museum of Outdoor Arts in 2021. And then eventually, I believe the following year in 2022, it's phased out to nothing. So uh, we're pulling back some of the funding for the Museum of Outdoor Arts, but it's in our budget, so we have to have it there. And then there's two items that we don't have uh, an idea yet of what it's gonna cost, but we are in the process of doing a compensation study for all positions in our city. Uh, that may have some impact on our budget, depending on what comes out of that. That's just the balance position salaries and make sure within range uh, for the positions that we have. And then the last uh, one is going to be the employee education and uh, professional development support. So ultimately, uh, we would like to continue uh, giving, you know, allowing uh, staff to go to trainings and uh, in-house type trainings as well. We don't have a dollar amount for that yet. That is something our human resources department is working on. Next slide. And then we go into the project requests. I won't go into too much detail. Um, you can see what they are, but from the Conservation Trust Fund, we have Bellevue Park and the train maintenance. It's an annual process there. Uh, Recreation of Mali fitness equipment replacement. It's a necessity as it's heavily used year after year. We have to do replacements. Pirates Cove uh, annual maintenance. Uh, this year we're replacing the splash pad element. So it's gonna be a new splash pad. Um, at Pirates Cove. There's a lot of other, the boilers, boilers uh, to heat the water in the pools. There's a lot of things that need to be maintained annually. We also gel coated the slides this year, so it's stuff like that. And then recreation center improvements, uh, tree replacements in the park. Um, this is different than the emerald ash borer issue that we have. This is just replacing the trees that uh, need to be replaced if dead and dying, not related to the, the ash tree. The Park Flower Bed Program, this is a great program that's both uh, contracted and a volunteer-based program, makes our city beautiful. And uh, all the flower beds are installed currently, so if you're driving around the city, you will see the results of this, this line item here. Um, and also through open space, we get funding for a position and a half, so it's one full-time position throughout the year that we have uh, an employee in our parks for, and then we have a half-time position that covers our seasonal, which has been hired currently for the summer season. And then last day's grant matching, which is extremely important, especially when we don't have as much funding for park upgrades and um, fixes and renovation and all that. This grant matching allows us to have some flexibility throughout the year to go after grants to help us maintain our parks and make sure they're um, nice and clean and green and safe and all that good stuff. So uh, next slide. And then out of our public improvement fund, the PIF fund, we have parking lot upgrades in our parks at 60,000 annually. The notorious ML Ash Borer program at 50. Um, we're hoping that stays, I think it will. It was, it was reduced to 25, but council has bumped that back up. Uh, Dave has done a great study 
um, and has a, a, a great report on the MOSH board and what it's going to cost annually to address the issues. And there's a lot of different methods we can go about addressing, addressing this versus just waiting for the, the board to show up and <laughs> take over our trees. We actually have treatment plans and different ways to address the issue that we can spread out some of those funds year after year to ensure our, our parks stay nice and the ash trees hopefully won't die. Uh, and then the golf cart uh, replacement for the golf course and our driving range equipment. Unfortunately, now this isn't counted in here, but this last storm we had one of our light poles go down and it ripped the netting at the driving range. So it's stuff like that that we're dealing with uh, as our facilities aging, lights or light towers are uh, rusting out and unfortunately in storm conditions they go down. So that doesn't quite cover the cost to replace the the lights at the driving range, but it's, it's to help replace the mats and some smaller items. Next slide. Can I ask can a ask question, question going back to that slide? slide? Yes, you can. Um, and that is, the golf course is a uh, enterprise, right? That's correct. So for the golf cart replacements and the driving range equipment, is that coming out of the golf course enterprise funds and, or is that general fund strictly general fund money? i believe that's the golf course and dave correct me if i'm wrong i believe it comes out of revenue it goes into the fund to help for capital replacements christina is correct i'm sorry dave christina is correct uh all the capital uh for the golf course comes out of the golf course fund okay so that's what I thought. So, yeah. As I recall, that the golf course funds, like any enterprise, like the water department or whatever, is one way. Right. It, it goes back, it can go back to the city, but the city can't go to it. Correct. That is correct. Any other questions regarding the, the budget? Uh, how about the, the the park ranger was thirty thousand dollars? Is that a part time person? No, it was actually one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, which would include the position itself. The, so the salary, all benefits included, a truck, computer, um, all equipment needed to uh, be part of that. So the the truck was thirty thousand as an estimate, um, includes the uniform, all that. So one hundred and fifty is the overall cost for that ranger. Okay. That's all I had. Okay. There's no other questions. That's all I've got for the budget. Um, as you know, budget changes, if there are changes, we'll definitely keep you updated um on that but uh that's the budget for this year it's a little light just because of covid we're being respectful of that and um as you all know the parks the bond isn't going to move forward either so we're kind of at a standstill this year but it makes sense with the situation that we're in okay well if there aren't any more questions we can move to the next item on the agenda which is covid update and facilities reopenings Perfect. So I'll start and then I'm going to pitch it over to Allison, who's on here to talk about the Recreation Center in Maui. But last night at the council meeting, we got approved to open Pirates Cove. So it'll open not this Friday, but next Friday um, to the public. It will be a reservation based system. We can only have 150 people in the facility um, at any given time. And so the plan is to make uh, the reservation for two hours. So we open at 10 a.m. So we have reservation spots from 10 to noon, one to three, and five, um, one to three, four, four, <laughs> four to six, doing the math. So we're gonna leave an hour in between each session to reset Pirates Cove, get it cleaned up and ready for the next group. So the max that we'll have in the facility at any given time will be, well, not 150, but total for the day will be 450 people. And so uh, unfortunately, we're gonna be operating at a potential loss, but council thought as a benefit to the community. So we're excited to open. The pools are filled, they're ready to go. Our lifeguards are gonna go finish their training up and uh, they'll be ready by the following Friday, to believe the 19th. 
uh, to go um, and, and let people into Pirates Cove. And then the other update is the farm is going to open, uh, probably not until the end of the month because we've got to get the animals there and acclimated and that takes about two weeks to do. We didn't bring them in because we weren't sure if we we're going to open, so we don't want to take them away from their current farms uh, to bring them in. So uh, Lindsay is overseeing that project and getting that ready to go. Everybody's extremely excited that we're going to kind of have some normalcy for our residents and visitors of those two amenities. And the train is considered an amusement and amusement parks are to stay closed for the current guidelines that are out. Um, so we're gonna keep the train uh, closed for now. We'll get new guidance uh, around July 1st. And the hope is that they'll lift some restrictions if COVID cases are dropping still and people are staying healthy. So if you do come to the farm or Pirates Cove, we are encouraging you must wear a mask to just keep us safe. If you're in the pool, we do not have, a, have to have a mask on, but if you're sitting around the deck, you will. So, um, Allison, you want to jump in and talk about the rec center in Mali? Sure. Sorry, I just got a security call at Mali, so I'm trying to, <laughs> to, to get that taken care of. Hello, everybody. Um, so, first thing I'll say on this, uh, this flyer, we needed to update it. The Friday time for the rec center is actually... Uh, 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. and this is a, a little older flyer but uh, we've, we've been updating this so it's 6 a.m. to 8 just as an FYI. Um, I kind of want to start off about um, what we were doing while we were closed if I can. Um, one of the, the best things that came out of this if anything is good about it uh, is that we won't have to have our annual closure in the fall in um, August and September so we were able to get a lot of projects done. Uh, we painted the gym. Uh, re, we had to redo the floor from September with some damage that happened. Uh, the lobby tile was replaced. It was a safety concern, so we got that done. Um, we, uh, one of the biggest projects was the pool deck. So the pool deck just got finished this week, and that was a three-week project that was gonna be closed in August and the first week of September. So it's really nice. It's a it's a much safer deck surface, um, and they, they just kind of finished it up yesterday. And uh, lifeguard training was today, and all that fun stuff, getting ready to open. Um, the roof repair was finally finished. That was a project from last year that we were able to get done. Um, construction. Well, we we contracted out to get uh, a new fire hydrant and some new ADA parking, so that we're uh, compliant with that with by code for our front area. So it's a there's no curb step up from those parking spots in the front, which was really nice. Um, our cameras in the front were uh, not able to be uh, repaired. So we got four cameras replaced, so better safety up front. Uh, we weren't even able to really see anything out of those cameras and lots of things happened in that parking lot out front. Um, the IT department worked on the new network and then the marquees are actually operational now. So the marquee at uh, the recreation center is able to we're able to have messaging and um, other things on that, um, as well as at Mali. Uh, there weren't really any big projects at Mali that needed to be done. Probably the biggest thing that came out of this is that we're really gonna look at replacing the carpet. That building is carpeted, and then with some kind of the disinfectant uh, concerns that we have, we're gonna look at a different flooring for that area. But anyway, so we got a lot done while we were closed uh, to the public. Uh, we were closed 91 days starting on Monday, so a long time. Uh, Mali was closed actually a couple days earlier. So um, we were able to uh, relocate some staff, uh, part-time staff onto the golf course and the hub and uh, help out the library and some other areas. So that was nice that we were able to keep some of them. Uh, we are ready to open on uh, Monday. Um, with some of those, uh, the guidance that was given at the rec center, we'll only have one person per lane in the pool. So there will only be a total of eight people uh, in the pool. Um, and then there's probably about 35 people that can work out in the center and then with staff um, per, for our areas that we have open right now. We have the zone room, the cardio, and the weight, weight rooms, and we also um, moved all not all, a lot of the equipment that is not electrical, we move that out on the track so we spread it out for people um, because the track is really hard to clean 
and people can go outside and walk now that we thought that was a better thing to keep that closed for a while, at least in this phase. So it's a phasing kind of thing. Um, another thing that we did that was kind of fun, we did a, a welcome back opening video that we're going to post tomorrow um, just to kind of help people with how they have to come into the center. Uh, we do have reservations. So that is the, an email is going to go out tomorrow. Another one about uh, kind of directions on how to do that. Um, that helps us keep track of how many people are in the building, as well as if there is um, anyone that comes down with COVID-19 that we're able to trace that. We're able to know who's in the building, which is a, which was a good thing. We're actually able to use that with our existing software, so that was helpful. Um, staff really came together on that. Um, we had our we started virtual programming really early, which was great. And we're going to continue doing some of those virtual classes. Um, this part of this phase is to not start classes just yet until we can kind of get a handle on how many people we can have in there and we can get through the safer at home order to see if any of those uh, requirements are uh, eased up or tightened up. And we'll, it's, it's kind of a moving target for us and every day is kind of different. I'm sure the staff can echo that and probably in your own work lives. Um, the other thing that the city is doing is we're going to have a special pandemic issue uh, for like the Citizen Magazine that'll come out around July 4th, right around there. So it's going to have a lot of information about the city and recreation um, and what we're doing and what we've done and how, what the impact is. Um, so kind of a quick, in a nutshell, um, what's going on. Um, you can kind of see on the flyer about this is, you know, phase one what's open and what's closed. And we're gonna move forward um, and open things as we see fit. Uh, if we can take some more people and able to control it, and we have the staffing and the cleaning supplies, then we'll do that. So, um, but that's, that's kind of it if you all have any questions. Do you guys have a specific number laid out for what you're gonna allow in at any one time, or is it just gonna be kind of on the fly you decide? No, we actually, um, there are some guidelines. So um, it's 10 person, 10 people per room. Um, okay. And some of the guidelines say like one, you know, one person has to be in a 120 square foot area. So basically 10 by 10 kind of. Um, we also have signage in the building that says how many people can be in a particular room. So if gotcha. you're familiar with the recreation center, the first uh, workout area that's kind of the um, the strength training we can have five people in there and they'll be six feet up you know they'll, to be able to be six to ten feet apart so um, we we were pretty proactive um, staff did a really good job of figuring out what signage we needed um, and uh, made those flyers and put them up and so it, I think it'll be pretty pretty good um, so we do ha definitely have that we also got little hand counters um, so that we can keep track at the front when we check people in, um, so we know how many people are in there. One of the things that's really tough is that we have to keep count of staff as well. You know, they're they're part of that equation. So, um, and then in the you know in the pool, whether there's two people or four people or eight people, kind of the lifeguard number is still the same. You know, for safety, there's still you got to have two guards out there or three guards. So, but yeah, we've thought quite a bit about how many people in each area. We have ambassadors, one ambassador on the first floor and one on the second floor, and they'll make sure that people are moving through and rotating equipment um, and that distance and cleaning things like that. So I think we're ready. Uh, at Pirates Cove, then with the, the center pool, uh, the kids pool basically, to, how many kids will be allowed in that pool? Are, are you talking about the recreation center or at Pirates Cove? Pirates Cove. Who is it? So we, um, we had to go to Tri-County and get permission. Originally, we were only going to be allowed 50 people total in the facility. And we, um, we said, hey, we have three pool areas. Is there any way it could be 50 people per pool? So that's how we, and they approved it. And that's how we got the 150 for the facility we would not be able to open with just allowing 50 people in the facility at any given time. We just couldn't afford that. So um, yeah, each pool area is considered its own area and we can allow 50 per pool. Great. Yeah. And 
are any of them, it sound like when you said 10 o'clock opening at 10, that uh, any of the morning classes then will be suspended for for the year at Pirate School? Yeah, that's correct. Um, we're, we're taking this slow. We may add classes as the summer progresses, but for now, we're just going to open it for uh, play, no classes, no extra. There's no, uh, they're not going to allow birthday party rentals yet or cabana rentals or anything like that. We're taking it slow. That could change come July. We may be able to open up more or maybe not. They could go the other direction. So we're going to play this day by day and make changes as, as needed. Okay, thank you. Mark, if you're talking, you're muted. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. Uh, yeah, if there's no more questions for Allison or Christina about the uh, uh, COVID updates and reopening of facilities, then we can move to Romans Park project updates. Okay, I'll take that. Um, we continue to have construction going on on the wall. That's the retaining wall that's on the south side of the tennis courts. Uh, that has to be built before we can move forward with construction of our grant project, which is redoing the tennis courts and the two playgrounds, uh, renovating those. So um, I think we're right on schedule with the wall. Uh, they've poured the footers in there. Um, they did two wall pours this week. And so, like I said, they, they continue to move forward. I'm, I'm really pleased with how that wall is turning out. Uh, I think it'll be a great addition to that. Uh, so far, there's been no impact to the wall from uh, the apartment complex there as well. Um, and if there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer. All right, sounds like there's no more questions, so we can move to staff's choice. Why don't we start with Allison? Allison, you got anything for us? She may be dealing with that security call. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, let's <laughs> let's uh, let's go to back to Dave then. Sorry. Had to get myself unmuted there. Yeah. Um, I think the big thing for us this week has been um, a lot of storm cleanup from the big storm over the weekend. Lots of downed trees, branches. Uh, park staff was called out uh, to remove branches and trees out of the tree uh, out of the street, and we continue this week to do a lot of branch cleanup. Um, the other thing would be. Um, we're doing a lot of table delivery to the downtown merchants. Uh, we received 14 tables and somewhere around 20, 30 chairs, and we slowly distribute those. Some of them were placed in the East Paseo, but the rest of them were getting requests from the actual restaurants and merchants to place those out in front of their actual businesses. And so as those come in, I know Rico's, George's, um, Inglewood Grand, and I'm not sure who else, but a number of the businesses have uh, requested the chairs. So we continue to uh, assemble those and shuttle them out to the businesses. Great, thanks Dave. Uh, Christina, do you have anything? Oh, not really. I think Dave covered all the, um, the Kind of help we've been doing citywide as far as the tables and chairs it's kind of exciting for the broadway area to um, have kind of this regeneration hopefully it stimulates uh, all the businesses down there and they get some business and uh, just so you all know this is gonna uh, it went before council last night and sean's probably signing off on it today or tomorrow but they're gonna allow for personal consumption so if you go into a business on broadway and you purchase food and you would like a drink uh, you can purchase your drink and take it outside and walk up and down Broadway. So I think that's going to be a really cool, fun thing for uh, people visiting Englewood. They get to do a little bit more than just sit at a table and have dinners and, and drinks. So 
with all this COVID, we're seeing some potentially fun changes and, and positive changes. So other than that, we are just working hard on getting everything reopened and staff has been amazing. Our library, unfortunately, is going to be closed for a while longer. Um, that state directive has been to keep libraries closed. So they're still doing curbside delivery and virtual uh, story times and virtual programs. So that's all I've got. Okay, well, let's go to commissioner's choice. Uh, Christine, got anything for us? I don't have anything. Uh, Stephen? Uh, just one minor thing. When I was out um, talking to some of the residents, uh, kind of through the dog parks, walking my dog the last week or so, they mentioned that there's been a little bit of some, uh, some aggression by the park rangers uh, extending to them driving into the grass area of the park to chase people down who had off-leash dogs and threatening them with arrest. Um, I don't know what that situation was. I did not witness it. Um, I was wondering maybe if uh, Dave or Christina, if they uh, pass through and might qu shoot a quick kind of a nonchalant question as to how that's going. I don't know what the direction is that the rangers are getting at, whether they're sort of being told to hardcore enforce the off-leash dog ones, but there was just, there was more than one person who mentioned that like, hey, by the way, we saw this ranger driving into the middle of Bates and Logan chasing someone down with an off-leash dog. And I, I get the enforcement argument for it. It just seems like that, if that's actually happening, might be a bit aggressive. So I don't know how to um, approach that with them. So I might ask, you know, the, the city employees to maybe mention that it may be over coffee or something and ask if that's actually happening or not. Stephen, I'll, I'll look into that. Um, obviously that sounds to me like code enforcement because we don't have rangers right now. Okay. Um, and I will ask for a reporting from uh, Dave Lewis and we'll report back to you next month. Thank you. Okay, thanks Stephen. Uh, Jim. Uh, just going a little further on the dog parks, I understand there is a, a pretty bad dog attack at Jason Park. Oh, I haven't uh, heard that. This past weekend, involved Dobermans that evidently have been problems there and at Bates Logan in the past, so. Oh, I think I know that guy. Yeah, I don't know if they were, um, I, I don't know the situation, but I know that those two, his, he trains security dogs, I think. And he routinely walks one or two Dobermans at a time. I know that the Dobermans, the mother and the puppy have gone out of it with each other. But I didn't, I hadn't heard anything as far as uh, interactions beyond the Dobermans between each other. So, but yeah, I, I have seen that, that, that gentleman many times and have actually watched one Doberman go after the other, so. Yeah, this was, they went after another dog and okay. uh, injured the other dog and I think he got sighted. I think um, he did, if, if I can jump in, Jim. Uh, that gentleman did get sighted. Um, there have been issues at Bates Logan Park that have been documented through code enforcement and then this last one. I did see it on next door and I did ask Dave Lewis about it. Um, and they did cite that gentleman. His dog is being quarantined until he has his court date. Um, and it did bite another dog and I guess puncture, it looked to me like his back leg or something, but uh, the dog was taken to the veterinarian and will heal and survive. That's all I have. Thank you. Uh, Kate. So um, I love hearing about the picnic tables and the open consumption situation. Has there ever been any consideration to maybe block off Broadway and create an opportunity for people to kind of go out there like masks on, but like kind of walking, hanging out. I was in golden two days ago and they're doing that on the weekends blocking off their main street and it i just i mean it could be really awesome so that's all i got they, they did it in idaho springs too yeah i think they're yeah. doing it in a lot of the small towns to try to get um the restaurants and, and businesses built up mm -hmm. yeah and it could be great for the small businesses in angola just make sure that people are actually attending them just an idea i think arvada and louisville or louisville are doing that also yeah 
and I, there was a poll, the city had a poll. Do you know okay. the re outcome of that, Christina? I don't remember the exact uh, numbers on it, but we are working hard in uh, the clerk's office and others to do a lot of extension of premises so they can expand their restaurants onto the sidewalk or an alley um, or a side street, whatever it may be. Um, they, I think they did at one point talk about closing down Broadway, but it's such a thoroughfare for cars mm -hmm. that they won't do it long-term. I mean, I know we do it for uh, some special events, but it's temporary. So, but yeah. they are working on an extension of premises so people can expand outward mm -hmm. uh, to have people on their patios or new patios. Yeah. Maybe just like one weekend would be kind of cool. I don't know, something to think about. Thanks, that's all I got. Hey, Gary, you have anything for us? Uh, I didn't hear Gary, but I think he said, unmuted and said that he didn't have anything. We'll have to assume that's right. I didn't hear any audio, Gary. That's okay. Um, all right. Uh, so, uh, Karen. Um, no, go. actually, there I am. <laughs> I'm, I'm fighting with this thing. Sorry, guys. Um, no, actually, and I wanted to say thanks to you guys for doing the stuff for the off-leash parks. Uh, I know this is, I think I've been on like 16 years, and it's been a problem since I came on. So hopefully we can finally get some kind of resolution. But that's it, thanks. And I haven't got anything else either. So unless there's any final comments or questions, then we can adjourn. Thanks everyone. Thank uh, Charles, uh, I see Charles raised his hand. Why don't we give Charles a chance for a final item? Go ahead, Charles. I can't Let's see. Am I unmuted? There, now you're unmuted. You okay. Um, I just wanted to, as a final thought, just thank you all and for the task force for uh, putting all the work into your proposition to submit to the city council. Um, as a, you know, as a member of the neighborhood and, and we're all pretty passionate about uh, having this work for everybody. Um, so I hope it does. And uh, I just wanted to just wanted to thank you guys and, and thank Christine for acknowledging the work that we put into it. Um, I appreciate that too. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Okay, with that, I think we are adjourned. Thanks all. Have a good one, guys. Bye, everybody. Yep. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Okay.